Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, episode 146 for the week ending March 15, 2019, the St. Paddy's Day Weekend Edition. First, a word from our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitor is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 750 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at www.affiliatedmonitors.com. In this episode, Jay and I are joined by Matt Kelly, who's going to report on the Ethisphere Global Business Ethics and Summit, which concluded this week in New York City, and talk about the ethics premium. We also look at the massive corruption scandal that rocked college admissions over this week. We take a look at FARA, what is FARA, and why does it apply to you? The former KPMG national practice leader is convicted in the POACB, that's PCAOB scandal. We ask, will the U.S. finally clamp down on shell corporations? We take a look at coaches continuing to behave badly in the NCAA recruiting scandal. The DOJ quietly modifies its corporate FCPA enforcement policy. We ask if Oracle violated the FCPA in India. One MDB is back in the news. And how do you engage your board of directors on cyber risks? We take a look at these and some of the other top stories that I know you will enjoy. We also review the five-part series that I had on the intersection of Sherlock Holmes and compliance with my podcast series, Adventures in Compliance. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. Uh, Together with Mr. Monitor himself, Jay Rosen, we are here for This Week in FCPA, episode 146 for the week ending, March 15, 2019, the St. Paddy's Day weekend edition. Although perhaps we could even call this the Ides of uh, March edition, Jay. What do you think? I'm all for I'm all for the Ides. Let's do, let's do that. Let's retitle. Oh, okay. Well, gosh, that means I have to uh, go in and uh, do some more editing. Um, perhaps, oh, my goodness. perhaps this week. Uh, okay. Well, Jay, we had a just an un unbelievable week. So um, uh, perhaps, and then we're gonna have a special guest. Uh, do you want to uh, tell our listeners who we're gonna have on? Matt Kelly is going to join us in about 20 minutes, and he's going to give us some highlights and updates from the recent Ethisphere conference that was held in New York City. So we're looking forward to that. But uh, as Tom just said, I can't believe it's only been a week. It seems like we've been talking about this college uh, interest uh, scandal for the last month, but I guess it's only been since Monday. So, Tom, why don't you tell us what's happening on that front? So for our listeners who currently reside on the moon or Mars, um, let me just wrap up a little bit what has happened in the world of college admissions this week. As on Monday, the Department of Justice unsealed uh, a stunning number of 50 indictments against uh, individuals, certain wealthy individuals and persons involved in college admissions. It was a huge scandal literally across the country of people who were paying off uh, are, are using a variety of corruption te- techniques and strategies to get their kids into prestigious universities. Uh, the, uh, there were two basic uh, schemes. The first was in the uh, college testing protocols for uh, everyone out there who's gone to college. You certainly remember your SAT or ACT day. The uh, parents would pay, bribes were paid uh, to uh, give a, not a deferment, but uh, <clears throat> obtain a medical uh, note that said the test taker, i.e. the high school student, had a medical condition and that they needed more time. When this happened, the ACT or SAT people always granted this, but the effect was that they were able to take the test by themselves and either the test was actually modified uh, with the student uh, 
a different person took the test or the test results were handed in and changed. So that was sort of corruption scheme number one. Corruption scheme number two that has gotten the most play was actual bribing of uh, college admission administrators, but more interestingly, uh, college athletic uh, department personnel, including coaches. Because the scheme here was that if Johnny wanted to go to, oh, let's just say USC, uh, and Johnny was five foot four, uh, a nerd, a geek, and probably was going to either go into compliance and or sell translations uh, in his future professional career, uh, he could be uh, admitted to USC as a shot putter. Uh, now, you to do so, uh, you might not think Johnny really had the body to do that, but you would simply Photoshop a picture of Bobby's head on a big old shot putter, and he would magically get a scholarship. And this... <clears throat> Was uh, for, unfortunately for USC, uh, this was run uh, actually out of that athletic department, and uh, but numerous other universities used the same or similar scheme. Uh, at the University of Texas, it was tennis. I think at USC they and Stanford they had the sailing coach, uh, but this went to Yale and the soccer coach. Um, it really was just stunning, and this was not chicken feed being paid. This was between hundred thousand to five hundred thousand. Uh, to get the student admitted fraudulently. So um, it really has just, I think, roiled the entire nation, um, Jay, and uh, e e people that I typically would not have associated with not only knowing about this, but even caring about it. I've heard, overheard talking about it. So um, it's really generated a lot of conversation, a lot of uh, conversation about privilege, wealth inequality, uh, the state of the U.S., uh, psyche in terms of uh, uh, values, uh, the values of my generation, of your generation, vis-a-vis -vis the millennial generation, um, a, a wide-ranging discussion uh, of people who uh, did something that they uh, probably knew was illegal. And once again, uh, it's pretty simple to get a kid into college uh, the, the uh, old-fashioned way, which is making a big donation to a university. Um, so, uh, it's a little, uh, unsettling perhaps, uh, for all of this. And as it unfolds literally every day, we have people at the highest levels of, uh, business and law. We had the, uh, managing partner at Wilkie Farr was caught up in this and has had to take a leave of absence. Uh, we've had, uh, heads of investment banking firms have been terminated for uh, doing this. We had actresses in Hollywood, but really it's not limited to one, um, uh, uh, industry for the parents. It's it's a socioeconomic group that had the money to pay. So how are you well, feeling out there in uh, in L.A. about all this? Well, it, it just reminds me of that adage, Tom, that, you know, you wouldn't want to do anything that you wouldn't want to see printed in the New York Times. <laughs> and unfortunately for uh, the two actresses, for all these other people who are involved, um, you know, their, their public uh, exhibit number one. So uh, I think there's going to be more and more to come out of this. Um, it's somewhat understandable from uh, the issues that we kept seeing with the NCAA and, you know, the whole thing with basketball, because I think there was so much riding on it for the university's uh, reputation and, you know, basically revenue generation. But I never really ever anticipated something that goes like this. And uh, it just tell you that each and every week we get a out of left field and this one is going to keep giving. Um, another thing that uh, looks like it's going to keep giving is uh, last week uh, I was in New Orleans at the ABA White Collar Crime Conference and one of the panel sessions they had was meet the regulators, and they had folks there, CFTC, the DOJ, the SEC, and um, basically uh, John Demers, who's the head of the Justice Department's National Security Division, uh, mentioned that they are going to start paying more attention to FARA, which is the Foreign Administration Act. And you may have heard about this vis-a-vis Manafort and that he was uh, a representative, that he was um, 
doing um, work for Ukraine, and he had not uh, classified himself under the FARA Act as being representative of a foreign nation. And this has been part of his downfall, which we've seen the past two weeks in the um, uh, two sentencing hearings. And what's interesting in, here is that Demer said that the department was overhauling its FARA enforcement and would assign Brandon L. Van Grack, a former prosecutor on the Mueller team and a deputy chief in the National Security. Security Division's counter espionage unit to oversee it. The new rule shows that the department has shifted from treating FARA as an administrative obligation and regulatory obligation to one that is increasingly in uh, enforcement uh, requirement. And uh, let's see here. Um, some people. People may think it could be going away once Manafort is locked up and the Mueller investigation ceases, said Wiley Rain attorney Tessa Capoletto. But I think the heightened focus on federal enforcement is here to stay. Between 1966 and 2015, the Justice Department only brought seven criminal FARA cases, according to a 2016 DOG, DOJ IG report. So I think what we're seeing here uh, with the CFTC announcement last met, last uh, week is that uh, there are a lot more areas uh, than just plain vanilla FCPA uh, where the government is going to start looking because uh, people's interests, are, uh, you know, people trying to get away with fraud and abuse and waste uh, can come from many different angles, whether it's uh, laundering or bank secrecy act. So I think. We're we're going to continue to see these uh, other laws uh, enforcement stepped up. Uh, next, we have a story that we've uh, been looking at for a while about uh, KPMG's national practice leader and the PCAOB. So can you tell us about that one, Tom? Sure. So um, uh, uh, David Middledorf, KPMG's former national managing partner for audit quality and professional practice, was convicted of four or five counts, including conspiracy and wire fraud this week in Manhattan. He was also convicted uh, with his co-defendant, Jeffrey Wada, a former employee of the Public County a public company accounting oversight board, the PCAOB, which regulates the audit industry. This was a huge scandal uh, for uh, KPMG and that they were stealing the, or rather purloin, purloining uh, the audits exams that PCAOB employees would do on certain uh, KPMG work. So basically they not only uh, knew when the, they, they, uh, had the, the test beforehand, and then they knew that audits were coming uh, as to the work they were doing. So it, this uh, was a really big scandal. Um, there were three other persons involved in this who were uh, who had previously pled guilty for reasons unknown. Middendorf uh, didn't think he'd done anything wrong and went to trial, and he got uh, pretty well spanked for that. But uh, three, excuse me, four KPG. KPMG partners uh, were terminated and either pled guilty or in Middendorf's case were was found guilty. Uh, Jeffrey Wada uh, had uh, wanted to get a job at KPMG, but uh, that had never been affected. Two other former PCAOB employees who went to uh, KPMG uh, also uh, pled guilty. So it was a total of five involved in this and, and a really big black eye for KPMG. Obviously, the PCAOB doesn't look very good either, but um, when you have an audit firm uh, actually engaging in bribery and corruption, um, that's uh, never good. Not at all. Um, no. Next up, we've got a couple articles that are, are taking a look at the U.S. finally clamping down on shell companies. Uh, in the show notes, we link to a really in-depth piece by Matt Stevenson at the Global Anti-Corruption blog. And then we also have an interesting op-ed piece from the Wa uh, Washington Post written by uh, General David Petraeus, former head of the CIA, and Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, senator from the state of Rhode Island. And I'm going to focus more on the remarks of Petraeus and um, Whitehouse. And normally uh, uh, 
this uh, article takes a look at the Cold War and what is specifically happening now between uh, Russia and their uh, uh, relationship with the United States. And we're looking at this in terms of the rule of law and corruption. And they go on to say in their op-ed piece, for figures such as Putin, the existence of America's rule of law world is intrinsically threatening. Having enriched themselves on a stack scale, exploiting positions of public trust for personal gain. They live in fear that the full extent of their thievery could be publicly exposed, and they actually uh, take their assets and are parking them here in the U.S. so they don't lose their um, ill-gotten gains. Um, the piece ends up wrapping with saying, hardening the nation's rule of law defenses is substitute for traditional forms of U.S. power, including military strength and economic dynamism, but it can provide an additional set of tools to bolster national security. In the intensifying worldwide struggle between the rule of law and corruption, the United States cannot afford neutrality. Complacency about autocracy beyond our borders risks complicity in it, with grave consequences both for the nation reputation abroad and Americans well-being at home. So I think that pretty much encapsulates again the struggle that we're going through in terms of if you have corrupt nations and they ignore the rule of law, it's are kind of the uh, diminishing results that you can expect. So both interesting articles and we suggest you read them in the show notes. Uh, Tom, do we want to bring on our guest now? Sure. So uh, we've just had pop up the coolest guy in compliance, and also the given coolest the coolest guy, the coolest guy in compliance, but also given it's uh, St. Patrick's Day weekend, uh, the top Irishman in compliance. So you're going to hold that moniker for at least three days, Matt. Welcome. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, thank you for the the new um, nickname. I will go have a beer early this afternoon in honor of it. I promise. So, Matt, uh, you were down at uh, the Ethosphere Global Business Ethics Summit this past week in New York. You've been uh, writing a fair amount about Ethosphere's World's Most Ethical Company Awards for 2019 and then the uh, the ethical premium. So uh, kind of in that mix, what did you see? What did you hear? And where do you think we might be going based upon all of that? Well, you know, it was a great event, Tom. So, yeah, Ethosphere had their Global Ethics Summit on Wednesday and Thursday in New York, and I did go down there. Um, you know, foremost, what did I see it was people, lots of people. This was a very big event this year. Uh, I think the total attendance was north of 500. I did hear that actually they were at capacity and had to turn some people away before the New York Fire Department started hassling them over overcrowding. So uh, the very good news to sell out an event like that. Um, but it, it was a very good show. I attended several different uh, smaller sessions that were very practical, hands-on you know, small panels of compliance officers talking about what they were doing, what worked well for them, and ideas other attendees could uh, borrow and steal for their own programs. Uh, there was a great one that I attended about how you might improve your program through sharp use of data analytics. Uh, where would you get that data? What do you do with it? What do you have to think about as a compliance officer to, uh, to plan to get the data? which is great because we all talk about how we want data analytics more, but how do you actually get it? So there's practical stuff like that. Um, and then also on Wednesday night, the Business Ethics Leadership Association, Bella, they had their Bella Awards, uh, which was also at capacity. And uh, special thanks to the compliance professional who shall remain not anonymous, but snuck me in through a side door and let me attend and uh, have some free food there. Um, but you know, what also was interesting to me, Tom, since you mentioned the ethics premium. So this is what, uh, Ethisphere usually does. They have their annual most ethical companies list, and they have noted that over the last several years, companies that are on their WME list have higher stock price appreciation relative to other large companies. And so it's about 11 percent more over the last three years uh, than other large cap firms. 
And that's just stock appreciation. So I had some spare time this week and I took a look at, I found 10 companies that have been on the most ethical companies list for at least 12 of the 13 years that Ethosphere has been doing this. And I looked at their financial operating metrics, not stock price, but actual financial performance metrics relative to the S&P 500 over the last, I think, six years I looked at. Uh, And lo and behold, these 10 companies uh, do actually perform better financially in several important ways than most large companies. Uh, They have a higher return on assets. They have uh, higher growth in operating income. Uh, They are a little bit wishy-washy on revenue growth, but the 10 companies are all very large companies. So I think we might want to remember that large companies do grow more slowly because they're already grown. Um, So what really stuck out to me, though, was that return on assets is, broadly speaking, a measure of how efficiently a company takes a dollar of revenue and turns it into profit. So the higher the ROA, the more efficient you are at um, becoming a profitable enterprise. Good news. But some of you, this may ring a bell because, Tom, you and I have talked before about other research that is out there that shows companies with higher internal reporting also have higher return on assets relative to their peers. So now we've got two different metrics that are correlate to being ethical uh, that say this also looks like it generates higher return on assets for companies relative to their peers. Ethosphere's uh, most ethical companies list, I don't know how much they weigh internal reporting and speak up culture. I assume that they look at it somehow and it factors in. But nonetheless, there is that other research that looked just at internal reporting. There is this research that looks at ethical companies. And I'm not privy to all the full details that Ethosphere uses to calculate that. But these companies that show better performance on these ethically driven metrics are also better at generating profit. Um, I kind of think that it makes sense because it gets to, if you're willing to talk about a lot of difficult problems, you're probably willing to talk about how to grow more profitably, you're working better as a team, you trust in each other, and all this other stuff that leads to efficient operations. So uh, that just stuck out at me. Um, But all in all, it was a very impressive event down in uh, New York. So hats off to all the Ethosphere people for putting it together. So Matt, did any of the the speakers particularly uh, strike you as uh, new, different, or or even uh, interesting? Well, there are a lot of speakers there who were interesting. I tend to go for the nitty gritty detail types. Um, So, you know, these are the small room sessions where there are practicing compliance officers just talking about, here's what we're doing. Um, Here's what works for us. Here's what doesn't. Uh, I hesitate to name any specific names, uh, but, you know, since these were relatively closed to small room sessions, but, you know, for example, one compliance officer talked about how she found uh, allegations of misconduct or hotline reports raised by women were less likely to be found substantiated than those raised by men. And she's like, well, why is that? Um, And, you know, perhaps, Are managers taking complaints less seriously? Are women complaining about different issues than men? What's going on there? It's a very good practical thing. Like, let's pull on that thread and see where it goes. Um, Many different compliance officers might have a thread like that to pull. Uh, There was another one who talked about having an interactive code of conduct. Uh, Another one who was talking about, and actually, this is a great one for compliance officers, um, you know, that he had built a database of common questions other compliance officers ask his company when they are evaluating his firm. We Do we want to do business with you? What does your compliance program look like? And I'm sure all of you get all these kind of questions from others who are performing due diligence on you. He compiled a database of due diligence answers that his salespeople can give. Um, all sorts of great practical stuff like that from there were dozens of uh, compliance officers from various organizations talking at these detailed kind of levels. Uh, so I, I can't really say I've got a favorite one because there are just too many who are giving too much good practical advice. But there was a lot of it there. 
Now, what was, you've obviously attended a lot of conferences. What was the sort of the buzz or the feel at this one? Any anything different, or at least what were the kind of questions you heard being talked about, or was it the college admission scandal? Oh, you would be surprised at how often the college admission scandal came up, um, which I think we could devote whole other podcast recordings to that subject for many, many days. Um, but it did come up a lot, and you know the sort of the visceral idea of how could trusted people, you know, the head of one of the largest law firms in New York, uh, the head of a impact ethical investing firm, you know, the movie stars, how could people who have a high profile, who know they're going to be looked at, still have these astonishing lapses in not just good judgment, but common sense. Um, And what did that mean? And, you know, what does that say about how seriously we commit to ethics versus how much we talk about wanting to commit to ethics? Uh, And occasionally that did come up um, in the bigger panel discussions that Ethisphere had too. Uh, people who were talking about how really a company can put its values into place. Um, it's not always easy. And there are several companies that were attending and speaking about ethics who had some very public, very black ethical misconduct lapses in their past. Some of them still struggling with that today. Uh, you know, but they were talking about the challenges of talking the talk is easy, but when you have to walk the walk as well. And a lot of people were just also talking about the college admissions scandal because you get it as a person. It's it's not complex like an FCPA issue or a data dis- breach in the disclosure. You know, these people cheated. It's something anybody in the street will be able to understand that that was not right. And that came up an awful lot. You'd be surprised. Matt, um, why do you think these things, you know, these things are coming to light now, but they've been going on for a while and my question is, is there just such a lack of ethics within our society, within our government? Do you think it makes it easier for people to have these lapses in judgment? Or why do you think we just see a new scandal every week, it seems? You know, I, I'll give credit to one of our fellow travelers here in the, the compliance world. So Louis Saperman, who, Tom, I know you have on from podcast from time to time and who was the former head of ethics and compliance in Dun & Bradstreet. So Louis was there and he and I were talking about this. And I thought he did bring up a great point that a lot of people think that it is, you know, it, it's relatively easy to think that you're ethical and it's relatively easy to talk about and even build apparatus for others to do ethics themselves, but then you kind of lose sight of the fact that being ethical yourself as a person takes a lot of work. And a lot of people, you know, who are mis- who are unethical and committing misconduct like this, I mean, to me, it's it's more like they're losing sight of the fact that they too are flawed and will make mistakes. And they have this certain arrogance about them that they might lose sight of the fact that the rules don't have to apply to me, or maybe I'm cheating a little bit. um, And so therefore it doesn't count. And then, well, if I did a little, I'll do it a little more. And then suddenly you're rolling downhill. Um, But, you know, Louis brought up a a really good point that uh, people just, they forget that you have to embrace ethics yourself, even when it sucks, even when doing the right thing is a pain in the neck, even when it's hard. Um, It's easier to come up with ethical rules for everybody else and point to them and say, we should all follow it. But it's a lot harder to come up with your own ethical rules or read them from somebody else and say, you know, it does apply to me. Um, I mean, I think this just cries out for a refresher course in ethics training for CEOs, board directors, lawyers, other gatekeepers, people who think that they're ethical because they know better And they misunderstand that actually, even if you do know better, you might slip sometimes and the training is still necessary. Uh, And I think that's probably true for everybody. So it just, I don't know. Like I said, you know, we could probably wax philosophical about this for an hour and I, I won't get carried away today. But that just, it came up everywhere while I was in New York. Well, I think uh, we may have a topic for uh, compliance into the weeds next week, Matt. We shall see. I, I, I have every confidence we will talk about this quite a lot. 
Well, Matt, um, you are welcome to to hang around and uh, listen in on the rest of the podcast. I forgot to send you our uh, list of topics, but uh, if you want to stick around and comment, we'd love to have you. Um, I actually, guys, I hate to say it, but uh, news breaks here. I have to go and finish up the compliance job support and put out the radical compliance newsletter, but I will be listening to this podcast when it's online tomorrow. All right. Well, Matt, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, I definitely look forward to our compliance into the weeds next week. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take take care, Matt. So, Tom, um, next up, uh, I alluded to this earlier, we got some problems with a, a basketball coach behaving badly at LSU. What's the story there? So, Jay, um, this it goes back to this is the NCAA recruiting scandal, not the college admissions scandal that we previously discussed. And this is part of the ongoing criminal case. Uh, and now NCAA investigations clue send in the clowns music here um, where LSU basketball coach Will Wade was caught on videotape, not videotape, excuse me, audio tape, um, allegedly talking about a uh, can't find the quote, but it's uh, something like a very superior offer uh, made uh, to someone, an unnamed recruit. Uh, and he was, oh, excuse me, quote, strong ass, end quote, offer. So um, sorry. That's we didn't a make technical any, term, right? That, yeah, it's a technical term in the bribery and corruption world, subset NCAA recruiting scandal, strong ass offer to a uh, recruit. It's not clear who that recruit was. It's been speculated that it's LSU guard Javante Smart, who is a freshman uh, from Baton Rouge, uh, who's believed to be uh, the subject of the uh, leak wiretaps. Nevertheless, uh, LSU uh, initially suspended him, uh, and now he's been suspended indefinitely. Uh, It's certainly a a black mark on Wade, uh, but for LSU, this is just devastating. This was their first SEC co-championship in uh, many, many years, and they were uh, number five, or uh, I think in the top 10, uh, and so uh, really uh, hurts the LSU program, but it just goes to show that more coaches are going to get ensnared in this as more information comes out, and as more of these cases either wrap up or go to trial, more of these wiretaps are going to come out, and it's and it's really just a huge problem. It's separate and apart from the college admissions. It's somewhat related, but um, really a, a different set of set of problems here. So, Jay, uh, next up we have uh, the FCPA corporate enforcement policy. So there were a couple of I thought interesting uh, modifications uh, to the corporate enforcement policy uh, and some uh, information about self disclosure. You want to tell us about those? Sure, Tom. So this came to us. Um, Last week, while we were also um, in New Orleans at the ABA White Collar Crime Conference, um, the DOJ's criminal division head, Brian Benkowski, uh, alluded to these changes during a speech at the ABA. And at the time, he said that the Justice Department is, quote, currently in the process of updating the policy to, quote, bring it in line with current practice. So there were um, you know, a, a couple different things in terms of uh, guidance and um, controls and disclosure. And basically, uh, these changes should cause some relief for in-house counsel and defense lawyers who were frustrated by what they saw as sometimes impractical requirements. So chiefly, one of it was uh, modifying the Yates Memorandum, and it now is advised to quote, to be eligible for any credit or cooperation, the company must identify all individuals involved or responsible for the misconducted issue. The length, the old corporate enforcement policy used for setting out the requirements, and now it's been tweaked uh, because they've said it's just not practical to provide all information. So that it's now substantial. Um, and then uh, at one point, Rod Rosenstein uh, announced, had an announcement that led to the then acting criminal, criminal division fraud section chief, Sandra Mosier, to openly wonder whether the FCPA corporate enforcement policy would have to be modified as a result. So I think at some point last week, uh, 
these changes were snuck in on the DOJ website and everything seems to come, be coming together on that. So in terms of uh, if you want to delve in a little bit deeper, uh, we connect to a story from um, – uh, global Investigations uh, Review from our colleagues Clara Hudson and Adam Dobrik, who I spent some time with in New Orleans, and that was a lot of fun. And then we also have another article that came to us from uh, one of the new writers at Risk and Compliance, uh, Wall Street Journal. And uh, Tom, I don't know how you say the first name. Is it Mengwai Sun? Uh, I think Any it's Ming- Minky. Uh, okay. but, uh, well, not quite, uh, sure because, uh, she and I have uh, not had the opportunity to meet, but, uh, I thought this was also interesting, Jay, because she, um, uh, interviewed, um, Efren Winwernick, the assistant chief of the, uh, DOJ's FCPA unit, who said that, um, uh, really in the context of the remark that individual prosecutions remain the fraud section's goal, that there's been an uptick in uh, self-reporting. This did not start with the 2017 uh, corporate enforcement policy, but really with the uh, pilot program launched in April of 2016. And and if you look at the continuum of where the DOJ was and and where it's been and and where it's going, you certainly see that uh, the pilot program was a key uh, step in moving towards uh, the corporate enforcement policy. And I think uh, the DOJ was cognizant that it needed, if I probably shouldn't have used that word, but I will, cognizant <laughs> that it needed to move um, towards uh, uh, not only uh, more leniency or, excuse me, uh, uh, more uh, credit given for self-disclosure, but also kind of putting the rules down on paper so everyone understood, here's what I do, and if I do these things, I will Uh, expect these benefits. And of course, those four things were uh, self-disclosure, extensive remediation, extensive cooperation, and profit disgorgement. If you met those four standards, you would, uh, the presumption would be that you would receive a declination absent aggravating circumstances. What we saw in the cognizant technology case was aggravating circumstances present, yet the company uh, received a uh, declination. So obviously, kudos to Cognizant Technologies, but also to the Department of Justice for moving uh, in this in this direction going forward. And that the uh, the other part, uh, kind of key point in the article, in addition to the Cognizant uh, re- Technology result, was that uh, the program uh, uh, is uh, really uh, starting with a pilot program with the new FCPA corporate enforcement policy increasing self-disclosures, and that really benefits everyone. So uh, now we have another uh, story about a a tech company that doesn't seem to be doing as well with its uh, FCPA enforcements. Can you tell us what's happening uh, on Redwood Shores with a little company called Oracle? Right. So first of all, this comes from Duncan McLeod, from Tech Central, which I think is a New Zealand publication. And if I've got that part right, uh, certainly my thoughts go out to uh, the people in New Zealand today and those in Christchurch and the families um, who were involved in the tragedy there overnight. So um, kind of shout out to New Zealand. We're, we're certainly standing with you if not thinking about you today. Um, and, and I find it really strange, Jay, that a... Um, New Zealand publication uh, would break this story because the story is that a whistleblower has alerted the SEC to possible FCPA violations against Oracle and the award of a tender in India um, and, excuse me, in South Africa. And that um, if um, the allegations are correct, uh, Oracle hired the person who awarded them the tender, i.e. the decision maker, shortly after the award was made, and that person left the South African government. Um, Oracle has uh, responded with a stern, quote, no comment, end quote, uh, to these accusations. Uh, I'm just a little surprised this has not been reported in the United States, but uh, if all of this is true, it certainly would probably warrant an additional uh, investigation uh, by the Department of Justice. Apparently, there was 
an internal uh, investiga- <coughs> investigation in 2017 by the U.S. firm Paul Hastings. There's no report on what the results of that uh, investigation turned up, uh, but uh, it certainly would probably be a part of uh, information turned over uh, to the SEC. And I don't even recall, Jay, that Oracle has publicly announced uh, in a a 10K or 8Q filing that there's an ongoing investigation, but the um, allegations revolve around the 2015 to 2016 uh, timeframe. So um, kind of an interesting article. Uh, Certainly, uh, Oracle is already, a uh, uh, at least on the SEC side, a uh, one-time FCPA violator, so it, we're going to have to follow this one. Mute button, I'm back. Uh, one of our favorite subjects who, uh, I guess it worked out, it was an even, so I get to take it. So I'm going to talk about one of Tom's favorite favorite fraudsters, J-Lo and the 1MDB scandal. Uh, back in the news again as former Goldman Sachs bankers uh, Timothy Leisner and Roger Ng were banking industry for life. Uh, we link in the show notes to uh, a Law 360 article by David Simpson. And also we're wondering, did J. Lo contribute to the Trump campaign? We have an article on that by Tom Wright and Bradley Hope in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, We've been talking about this one for, it seems like, a, a couple of years, Tom, and it, it just keeps on giving. But um, we're, w- what is the uh, nature of the potential link between J-Lo and Trump? So uh, according to allegations, J-Lo, one of his shell companies, gave money to a uh, person in Hawaii who donated that money through a series of shell corporations to the Trump campaign. Um, but if the newspapers were pretty able, were able to figure it out, you know, you have to figure uh, government enforcement agents could figure it out. If it's a truly a donation from a foreign entity, that violates some U.S. law about not having foreign interference in U.S. elections. Um, and if it's money coming from J-Lo to Trump, you know, it's just one more instance of uh, corrupt persons trying to buy influence uh, with the Trump administration, either by staying at his hotel or uh directing money to uh, his uh, inaugural campaign. So, uh, but you're right. It keeps on a going. So can I take us off script for a sec? Um, This just kind of popped in my mind with the second more stringent Manafort um, sentencing this week. uh, Do you think that has uh, speaks anything towards uh, changes that we're going to see moving forward, either in FCPA or white collar crime due to the two disparate decisions from the judges involved? Um, you know, I haven't really thought about that enough to know. I, I think it'll have zero effect on the FCPA. Okay. So let me uh, tee up for the one. Um, what can the board of directors do to be more engaged with regards to cyber risks? Uh, why don't you tell us what's on Deloitte's Khalid Kark's Barry and Debbie McCormick's mind. So this was, I thought, a very interesting article in the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance and Financial Regulation. If you don't subscribe to this on a daily basis, you should, because uh, although the focus is corporate governance, uh, it, it really has some very interesting articles, very well-written articles, and also from time to time touching directly on anti-bribery, anti-corruption. This one's a little bit different, but I was intrigued with it for two reasons, Jay. First of all, uh, the issue of technology, cyber, and risk at the board is something that I think compliance practitioners need to start becoming more aware of, particularly on the risk component. But also, it really laid out a way to think through approaching the board on a new issue. And if you've really not had substantive uh, conversations with your board this article really lays out how you can think about talking to them, uh, talking to them about uh, having strategic conversations around compliance, talking to them about compliance trends, talking to them about balancing 
offense and defense around compliance, talking to them about performance and compliance, risk and compliance, strategy and compliance, and then uh, how you might uh, present information to them that would be in a persuasive format. And and I think many compliance practitioners struggle with this issue. So I thought from both a, a macro and micro perspective, it was just a fascinating article. Well, it's uh, excellent. We've got uh, we refer to it in the show notes uh, as we get towards uh, the end of our items this week. Tom, can you give the folks a brief little flavor of the, your um, five part, uh, podcast this week on adventures and compliance? Sure, Jay. I return to one of my favorite characters, Sherlock Holmes, to take a look at uh, some different issues in compliance. I had a five-part series where I looked at the Red Circle, the Abbey Grange, the Priory School, uh, the Six Napoleons, and the Empty House in context of some various compliance issues. They are short, sweet, uh, I think eight and a half to nine minutes per episode. Uh, I get to talk about Sherlock Holmes. I get to talk about compliance, two of my most uh, favorite topics. Uh, it's on the plethora of platforms, the FCPA Compliance Report, iTunes, JD Supra, Panoply, uh, YouTube. We're also on Spotify now and now on the new Corporate Compliance Insights. Um, so, um, and then Jay, uh, before you take us home, I'd like to announce to our listeners that uh, tomorrow We'll be posting our next Popcorn and Compliance podcast, where we take a look at the uh, recently released Captain Marvel. We've got a lot of interesting insights, and of course, Hollywood insider uh, Jay Rosen, uh, now Mr. Monitors. Uh, I don't know if you can be both Hollywood insider and Mr. Monitors, but nevertheless, you are. So uh, he's got a lot of interesting insights. Uh, It was a fun movie, and I think you're going to enjoy the podcast. You want to take us home? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, on behalf of Tom Fox, the compliance of this, and Jay Rose and Mr. Monitor, we'd like to thank you for joining us for this week in FCPA episode 146 for the week ending March 15th, 2019, uh, formerly entitled the St. Patty's Day edition. But we're going to call it what, Tom? The Ides of March. The Ides of March. So thanks for joining us. Uh, Have a great weekend. And as Tom said, uh, please be on the lookout for Popcorn and Compliance, where we take a look at the global smash Captain Marvel. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, you can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Finally, I'm putting on a compliance masterclass this next week in Chicago on the 20th and 21st. I have a couple of seats open. If you'd like to uh, take a look at the best practices and compliance programs, this is certainly the course for you. You can email me with questions about registration at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you'll join Jay and I next week where we take a look at some of the week's top ethics and compliance stories which caught our eye. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.